Thank you so much, everyone, for joining me tonight. Um, the title of this presentation is Carolyn Sutherland, A Haunting Tale of Fashion and Tragedy. And this is the story of a beautiful young woman who died too soon of an exciting museum donation and uh, just a hint of a ghost story mixed into it. So as I go through here, um, I am going to Make sure I can advance my slide. There we go. Um, I'm going to run through this story kind of as it happened to me. So um, as a curator of history, um, I work with historical objects, um, donations to the Illinois State Museum's collection, um, also um, um, I work with the existing collections. And so the most magical part of my job is when there's an object that's stunning on its own and it comes with a little bit of information and then that little bit of information leads to more information and that more information leads to an even more powerful object that tells a fuller story and it has um, often kind of an emotional impact and so um, this uh, collection that we're talking about this young woman's story um, I think just hits all those marks um, it's incredibly significant as an artifact collection it's incredibly um, poignant and moving um, as a human interest story and um, also there's that ghost story thrown in which only just makes things better so this all began for me. Um, you are probably all familiar with the fact that the Illinois State Museum has its um, fashion exhibit up right now. It's called Fashioning Illinois, uh, 1820 to 1900. And so when I was beginning um, object consideration for this exhibit, one of the things that um, I pulled out to look at was this dress that you're looking at right here. Um, this is a wedding dress. Um, it dates from the 1850s. You can see that it's an absolutely stunning condition. And um, this is what we knew about it. We knew that it was worn about 1850 by Carolyn Sutherland, daughter of Samuel Sutherland, Chatham Center, New York. She married K.L. Layton and lived in Rockford, Illinois. Um, and so it's really only, you know, two lines of text. It doesn't seem like a whole lot of information, but actually in terms of historical research, this kind of hit all the highlights. Um, we had a name of the wearer. We had um, a couple other names to cross-reference with. And then we also had a couple locations to cross-reference with and a date range. So putting all that together is enough to um, triangulate a historical search where um, one can find more information about Carolyn. So the first thing I did, and um, I am a professional historian, and this is my tip to all the other historians out there and all the lay researchers and genealogists, start with a Google search. Um, before I you know, crack into census records or manuscripts or anything like that, I just do a good old Google search with the terms and quotes and see what Google can pull up. Um, and usually you can find a little you know, entryway into some good information that way. So that's what I did. And the first thing, the first hit I turned up on Carolyn Sutherland, Chatham Center, New York was, surprise, surprise, Haunted Catskills, a book of ghost stories from the Catskills area of upstate New York. Um, and so uh, the first thing that this, uh, this book mentioned, I'm intrigued now, you know, where is this going? This is a dress in a museum collection in Springfield, Illinois. Um, the first thing this book um, starts out with in terms of Carolyn Sutherland was her body was found in the crypt with no other, um, and I can't read my own handwriting, with two other coffins. Hers was cast iron with an eight by 10 window. When the glass was cleared, people saw a beautiful young woman dressed in a bridal gown, holding a rose in her right hand over her breast. Her features were perfectly preserved. Even the rose seemed fresh. The remains of Mrs. Carolyn Sutherland, born in Chatham Center, the only daughter of John and Maria Wilbur Sutherland. John and Maria Wilbur Sutherland. And the, the Little blurb on Carolyn Sutherland wound up with, the book said that residents in Chatham Center say that sometimes they've seen a young lady in a white bridal gown walking through the local fields on June 13th, the date of her marriage to John Layton in 1854. 
So you recall that the information I had about her, that her name was Carolyn Sutherland, and that she was from Chatham Center, New York, really lined up quite nicely with this ghost story here. So the big red question flashing through my mind at this point is, does the ISM have a corpse's wedding dress in its collection? How can I be looking at a wedding dress and also be reading a story that says that this young woman whose information correlates was buried in her wedding dress and is seen walking around in her wedding dress? So this is the most pressing question in my mind at this point. And so I called in some reinforcements. We have a wonderful um, volunteer historical researcher named Dean Farmer who works with us. And I gave him the bits of information that we have, that it was worn by Carolyn Sutherland, daughter of Samuel Sutherland of Chatham Center, New York, um, and said, okay, what can you find? This is the situation. And I have to say, Dean never disappoints. And so he came back immediately with some pertinent information. Um, probably the, the the biggest breakthrough right away was um, the 1850 census. And so what we're looking at here is the Sutherland family listing in the uh, 1850 census for their county in New York. So you'll see that the um, head of the household is Samuel Sutherland, which kind of lines up with our blurb of the dress. However, if you look closely, the number after his name is his age. So he's 24 in 1850, and Caroline is down there at the bottom of the household, and she's 15. So clearly, uh, Samuel is not Caroline's father. Um, this is probably the source of the confusion. He's listed as the head of the household, but um, indeed, he's probably her brother. And if we look at the ages of the household, we can deduce that Samuel, listed first as the head of the household, Mary H., who's 21 years old, um, is his wife. Maria, who's 45 years old, um, seems to be his mother. And Caroline, who's 15, is the daughter. So we have a um, family household here where the, the patriarch seems to have been um, deceased and the brother assumed the role of the patriarch. And later on, it was pointed out to me that um, this is probably rather unfair as far as it goes for Maria. Um, Maria, the mother, probably rightfully should be head of the household. You know, it's, it's her house that everyone seems to be living in. Um, and so uh, her son got the status of head of the household by virtue of being the oldest male. But um, it was probably by rights, you know, her house and and. Um, her authority in the household still, even over her almost adult children. One other thing to note is that, uh, if you note the 12,000 on the side is the value of their uh, estate and $12,000 is uh, quite significant. So this is a very well-to-do family. Beyond that, our researcher was able to um, uncover photographs. So it's always amazing when you can put faces with names. We see that uh, Maria Wilbur Sutherland, who lived from 1886 or 1806 to 1886. This is Carolyn's mother. And then her brother, Samuel, right there, um, the head of the household, sensibly, um, who lived from 1824 to 1879. Um, and Finally, um, we have, uh, Dean was able to come up with a picture of Carolyn that was floating around the internet. Um, and so again, just amazing to have a visual of someone who we've got her dressed, we know a little bit of information about her, but now we can um, really, you know, look at her. And this is a woman who was photographed in the early 1850s. Um, and just from this head and shoulders view, there's a lot we can tell about her. Um, we can tell obviously that she's a very lovely woman Woman. Um, she's also very fashionable. Uh, this hairstyle that she's sporting there is the height of 1850s fashion. Um, 1850s was a little bit crazy in terms of its hair and it was also a very like um, uh, kind of vivacious and vibrant decade in terms of fashion. But these side hair poofs there um, or um, you know the wider the better. The wider they were the more fashionable you were and they were clearly very wide for her. She's got very stylish earrings on. Um, you can kind of just tell that this girl is the belle of the ball here. So what we know at this point is that um, in terms of the provenance of her dress, that it started out being owned by Carolyn Sutherland Layton, who died in 1855. 
Um, then we have some big gaps in our provenance. Um, we know that it was donated to Illinois State University by Robert and Helen Brown Wells. And then it was transferred from Illinois State University to the Illinois State Museum in 1993. Um, but this is still, um, there's still a problematic gap in the, in the provenance here. Um, there's still a lot we don't know. Um, so a big breakthrough in terms of our research came when Dean was able to reach out through Ancestry.com and he actually made contact with one of Carolyn's descendants. Um, this was a great granddaughter of Carolyn's surviving brother. And this was, um, this was part one of the historical jackpot because this particular descendant um, not only existed and was out there, she also um, very graciously responded right away and said, um, yes, I know all about her, give me a call and I'll tell you anything you wanna know. And um, I did, you know, you can imagine my excitement when I called up. And so um, we, we learned quite a lot about her. Um, First of all, we learned that Carolyn was a graduate of the Troy Female Seminary in Troy, New York. Um, her mother had gone there. Also her sister-in-law, Samuel's wife had gone there. And this institution was actually the first women's higher education institution founded in the United States. It was founded by women's rights activist, Emma Willard in 1814. And this was founded as a place for, um, I think it's called for young ladies of means. So for prosperous families to send their daughters. This was a place designed for women to get the same educational opportunities as men. So women were taught math, classical languages, sciences. Um, these were educational opportunities that really didn't exist anywhere else in the United States at that time. So uh, Carolyn's parents clearly had a very um, liberal idea of educating young women. Um, she was afforded the privilege of a really rigorous education that very few women at the time had. Um, so we can see this very progressive views in her family and kind of extrapolate that Carolyn herself um, was a very well educated and probably a very bright woman. And incidentally, um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton had also attended the same institution, although they didn't overlap. Um, Cady Stanton had graduated probably about uh, 10 years beforehand. And so we also had um, a lot of family information here um, that helped us kind of fill in the gaps. We learned that uh, Carolyn's father was a prosperous uh, doctor and he passed away in 1842 when Carolyn was only 10, um, which correlates with what we saw in the census with her mother being the head of the household. Um, the father was uh, buried in the family crypt. Um, then um, the brother and the mother in 1856 moved from New York to uh, Bloomington, Illinois, or the McLean County area specifically. And this was because um, the brother Samuel uh, was thought to be consumptive and moving west to Illinois was thought to be good for his health. And so um, he came um, with his wife and their infant, and they brought their mother, um, Martha, with them. So in 1856, uh, Carolyn has passed away, and um, the brother and mother moved to Illinois, so all the family connections directly to New York are severed at this point. And so based on all the information that the descendant provided, we're able to establish this uh, complete chain of custody here. So as best we can determine, um, this wedding dress was worn by Carolyn Sutherland Layton, and it probably reverted back to her mother, uh, Maria Wilbur Sutherland, after her death. Um, after Martha's death, it passed to her son, um, Carolyn's brother, Samuel, and his wife, Mary. Samuel and Mary had a daughter, Anna, who married Alan Brown. And incidentally, um, Anna sadly passed away in 1894 at the age of 40. And her husband, Alan, uh, 20 years later, married her sister, Alice. So Anna's um, kids uh, eventually had their aunt as their stepmother later on in life. But Anna had a daughter named Helen who married Robert Brown Wells or Robert Wells. 
And after Helen's death, it seems that her widowed husband, Robert, passed on the dress to Illinois State University, which is also in McLean County where the family had moved to. So um, we have a pretty um, tight chain of provenance here. So, um, so about Carolyn, um, we also learned that um, she was probably what we could consider the bell of the ball in Chatham Center. She was um, from a very well-off family. She was very attractive. She was very well educated. Um, she seemed to have no shortage of suitors. And she ended up marrying a man named John Layton, although it's also been um, variously reported as Reuben Layton. So he's kind of the biggest question mark in all of this. We know they were married in Newark, New York in, on June 13th, 1854 and that John or Reuben, Mr. Layton, let's call him Mr. Layton, that Mr. Layton took his bride, Carolyn, to Rockford, Illinois to begin their new life together. And so that's where they settled. Um, and Carolyn um, very quickly probably learned that she was expecting her first child. And uh, we do know, sadly, that um, she gave birth to her child in uh, June of the following year, 1855, and died in childbirth. And um, sadly, her baby passed away as well 11 days after her death. And from the family reports, her mother had been in Illinois with her, probably helping her prepare and to be on hand to prepare for the birth. Um, and then she had to um, she had to oversee her daughter's funeral, and she had to care for her daughter's um, orphaned baby for eleven days, and then lose that baby as well. So um, the the absolute heartache and anguish that Maria Wilbur Sutherland experienced um, in 1855 is almost you know beyond measure. And so what happened was that uh, Carolyn was. Um, given a funeral in Rockford, Illinois for her husband and new friends there. And then um, her body was taken back to New York where she had a second funeral. So you'll recall in the vault, they talk about um, Carolyn having had a glass faceplate on her casket. And so that probably um, was meant for a, a second viewing. She was um, entombed in a very expensive iron casket that was designed for traveling, um, for, for moving bodies to, to burial grounds. And so she and the body of her infant daughter were taken home to New York and she was given the second funeral and buried there. Um, and probably her belongings were packed up with her and taken home um, with, with, her, with her remains at that point. And so, um, and I need to check my notes just a second because I might have gotten a little bit ahead of myself. Oh, I skipped a page of notes. That's where we are. Okay, so back to that story um, about Carolyn's body in the vault. So fast forward to 1836, Carolyn has been returned to New York. Um, she's been entombed in the family vaults. This is the vault where her uh, father's mortal remains are laying and also the remains of her father's parents as well. In 1936, the door to this vault had kind of crumbled in from age and a young boy who was sort of poking around um, saw this open door to a vault and couldn't resist and so he went inside and inside he saw um, the um, disintegrated remains of three wooden caskets. He saw a bronze baby casket and he also, and this is the interior of that vault, he also saw the iron casket that belonged to Carolyn Sutherland. And as the story mentioned that we started with, um, there was a glass faceplate and he brushed away the dust from the glass faceplate and beheld the perfectly preserved features of a beautiful young woman who was also holding a rose at her chest and the rose even seemed perfectly preserved. 
And this seemed like a miracle to the local townspeople. Um, and all these stories started flying around. Who was this beautiful woman? How could she be so perfectly preserved? There was a story that went around that um, perhaps she had been the daughter of a sea captain who um, had taken her out to sea to travel for her health. And he had brought an iron casket along in case she passed away at sea and he needed to transport her body home for burial. Um, of course, that wasn't the case, but the, the curiosity and the rumors spread through that little village in New York in 1936. And so um, people would troop out there and they would bring candles and they would bring torches and everyone wanted to get a look at the, um, this perfectly preserved body. Um, it got to the point where the local sheriff had to stand guard because there was a fear of vandalism. And indeed, the stories report that at one point the glass faceplate of the coffin was cracked. And at that point, um, the body crumbled to dust. And so eventually the remains of the occupant of this vault were reinterred at the Chatham Center Cemetery. Um, and Carolyn was laid to rest finally with her uh, infant daughter by her side. So some questions that remain from this, um, back to the first one we started with, was Carolyn buried in her wedding dress? Um, that is the family story. The ghost story indicates that she was buried in her wedding dress. The stories of seeing her um, in, in the casket in the 1930s indicate that she was in her wedding dress. Um, and this is a hard thing to square with the fact that we have the wedding dress in the Illinois State Museum's collection. Um, clearly ours is in good enough condition that it, it doesn't look like it's ever been interred. So how can it be both buried with the occupant and um, in our museum collection? And so my educated guess to address this is that um, Carolyn, oh, shoot, I'm sorry. I meant to give a trigger warning, sorry. Trigger warning, um, I'm going to show a post-mortem photograph and um, it's, uh, it's a, she looks like she's sleeping. It's not like a crime scene type photograph, but if anyone is sensitive to that, um, please look away and I'll tell you when the image has left the screen. And I am so sorry, I didn't give that warning ahead of time. Um, so my, my answer to that question was Carolyn buried in her wedding dress is um, most likely not. Um, probably she was buried in what was known in the 19th century as a shroud. And this was a type of um, after death garment that men and women alike were often buried in. Um, Sometimes women were known to have sewn a shroud for them at the same time they were making their wedding trousseau. So as they're making linens for their future life as a young wife, um, they're also looking ahead to their end of their life and sewing the garment that they'll one day be buried in. And a shroud um, could be as elaborately trimmed as a day dress um, and would have resembled uh, a typical day dress when, um, when it was being viewed. Um, the difference was that um, a shroud uh, was open at the back and it had large um, sleeves and loose sleeves, um, so a little bit easier to, um, to put on someone after they have died. Um, and in fact, we have this great contemporary description of a shroud. Um, here in Springfield, a woman named Helen Edwards attended the funeral of a girl named Nettie Campbell, who died at age 22 in 1867 of consumption. And so Helen attended that funeral and then wrote, she looked lovely in her shroud of finest white merino, a ruche about her neck and a tool fastened at the side with a pure white flower in her hand. So reading that description of a burial shroud with a, a white merino ruche and tool fastened around her head, um, it really kind of sounds bridally. So, so again, my best educated guess is that um, Carolyn was probably buried in a shroud that was elaborate in nature um, to the point where if you're only seeing, you know, an eight by 10 view of her through a faceplate, it would probably read like a wedding dress to someone looking at it. The second question was, how was her body so perfectly preserved? Remember in 1936, which is let me see, more than 80 years after she died, um, she was still uh, 
beautiful looking and to the point where the rose that she clutched in her hand was still in perfect condition. Um, and this is uh, pre embalming technology, which didn't really take off until uh, the Civil War. So what's going on there? Um, and the answer to this lies in the type of casket that uh, Carolyn was buried in. Um, probably she was buried in the Fisk's patent metallic burial case, or if not Fisk specifically, then it was something very like this. And this is something that uh, was very popular in the late 1840s um, through about the mid 1850s. This was a new patent and it was designed for transport um, for people like Caroline who had passed away in one location and had family or burial grounds in another location where the body needed to be moved. Um, and so these uh, iron cases are actually hermetically sealed and in the absence of oxygen, um, there is no decay. So in this hermetically sealed case, um, Carolyn's remains were preserved perfectly. And you'll recall it was only when that glass faceplate was cracked when air uh, reached her body that the decay started to happen. Um, so this was um, this is a very expensive option. Um, you know that the statesman John C. Calhoun of South Carolina was buried in a similar burial case. Um, so again, it was something for um, people of means and people who uh, really wanted that last look at their loved one. Um, the faceplate was an important feature because in the 19th century, people placed a lot of emphasis on what they called the good death. And a good death involved someone who um, was prepared to die, who knew what was coming, who um, accepted their fate, who had made peace with their maker, who had had a chance to say goodbye to family, um, who was surrounded by family and friends, and who kind of let go peacefully. And um, um, with, with death sort of ever present in 19th century, people really consoled themselves with the idea that when people had passed away, they had had a good death. And so being able to look at someone one last time and see their features and see them looking peaceful and in repose um, was an important part of the, the grieving and letting go process. So again, we can imagine Caroline having passed away far from home, um, far from everyone she loved. Remember her brother and sister-in-law were still back in New York at that point. Um, and so her, her body was taken home. So all her family and the people that she had grown up with um, could assure themselves that she had had a good death and say goodbye to her one more time. So the final discovery that came from the descendant is the absolute jackpot. So finding a descendant who has information and is uh, graciously willing to share is um, just amazing. But winning the lottery is when that same descendant comes to you and says, oh, we were recently cleaning out the family house and we found a trunk of Carolyn's belongings that have been untouched since her death and I'm willing to donate them to the museum. Are you interested? So this like, it just doesn't get any better than that. You know, the, the item we did have, her, her dress there, and the story that went along with it was already enough, but knowing that there was more, that this woman's short life um, was still being preserved in some fashion through her belongings um, and able to be interpreted and preserved by the museum um, was just um, incredible. It's, it's like kind of, you get to know someone and they've passed away and then it's like finding a little piece of them and, and discovering more about them. So um, I was over the moon and this was one of the highlights of my year as a curator when this uh, collection came in. So this descendant uh, joined us at the museum and brought with her Carolyn's belongings and it was like Christmas day, opening them up and seeing what they um, entailed. And so I'm sure you're all wondering too, the big question, which item of, of Carolyn's clothing survived? And here is where I'm going to give it over to Elizabeth um, briefly. We actually uh, filmed me looking through the box and since then the clothing has been um, cataloged and we've boxed it up in an acid-free box and it's in our climate controlled storage but I'm going to go through the box with you um, piece by piece just as, as if I'm discovering it for the first time so you too can experience the joy of this 
surprise and delight and amazing donation that came to us. Um, so with that, uh, Elizabeth, if you want to fire up the video. So here we are in our uh, art prep lab. Um, this is where we store and prepare artifacts uh, before they go on exhibit. And here we're going to look at the donation of Sutherland clothing that we received. And before we go through the box of donations, um, I did want to show you a garment that we already had in our collection. This came to us with the wedding dress that's on display in the exhibition. Um, and it's this wonderful um, 1850s petticoat with this cartridge pleating here. And as typical for many women of her time, um, Carolyn stamped her name in her undergarments. And this was um, for laundry purposes. So if you imagine on wash day, everybody's personal linens in the entire household going into one big laundry pot, um, it can lead to a lot of confusion afterwards determining who gets whose garment back unless you put your name in your underwear. So Carolyn did this, so we know that was her laundry mark and that this definitely belonged to her. Which brings us to the box of clothing. So um, to recap, when we found Caroline's uh, descendant who happened to say that, oh, not only can I tell you everything about Caroline, I also have a box of her clothing that I'm willing to donate. Um, it's kind of like winning the jackpot as a history curator. Um, not only finding someone with the information, but with artifacts related to this specific person who died more than a century and a half ago um, was incredible. The question always remains with objects um, about provenance and, you know, did these objects really belong to a certain person? And um, with objects, unlike manuscripts, it can be difficult to tell. You know, if it's someone's personal papers or letters, usually they've signed it and it's in their handwriting and it's very easy to determine. With objects, um, we get a lot of offers of donations that say, you know, Lincoln might have sat here, or this might have belonged to a famous person, but the documenting and actually proving that assertion um, becomes hard because not a whole lot of people take pictures of their stuff or you know, write letters where they mention their stuff. Um, so establishing that chain of ownership becomes difficult. So when I first received this donation of clothing, the first question in the front of my mind was, this is amazing, but is it really Caroline's? And especially with someone whose um, clothing had sat in a trunk since the 1850s, um, you know, could it have been someone else's? Could someone else have stuffed their clothes in this trunk in the attic? Um, you know, is it really hers? Okay, so you can imagine that um, when the donation of this clothing came in, it was sort of like Christmas morning, the anticipation of seeing what was there and um, the question hovering of whether it truly belonged to Carolyn Sutherland. And so as I opened it up, and I'm going to go through the objects in this box, they've been um, properly stored in acid-free boxes with acid-free tissue paper, but I'm going to take you through them in the same order that I first saw them so you can experience along with me what it was like. So the first thing that we received was a chemise. So this is your foundational garment that's worn closest to the skin. Um, this is something that would be washed or at least changed every day and um, uh, would, would kind of absorb the dirt and sweat and oils of the body. Um, so one of the first things I noticed was under the arm, we have Carolyn's laundry mark. So, um, you know, this is again, you know, a, a jackpot within a jackpot. Not only does this clothing survive, but Carolyn's name is marked on it. So, this tells us 100% truly that these were her clothes. And again, I can't stress how rare and extraordinary it is from a museum point of view that this um, woman who, who passed away in the 1850s, an entire collection of her clothing um, survived undisturbed and came to light and found its way to us. Um, so we were thrilled to see it and thrilled to see what else was among the collection. So in addition to her chemise, We had several of her day caps. And so day caps, um, 
In the 1850s, these would have been something that a woman wore around the house. Um, a fashionable young woman like Carolyn probably wouldn't have been going out to parties in day caps. This is kind of um, the, the 19th century remedy to a bad hair day. Um, if you don't feel like doing your hair up in an elaborate way, you kind of pull it back and put a day cap over it and are around the house like this. Um, it does become kind of associated with older women, so you start to see these by mid century being worn out and about by older ladies. But Caroline, if she was going out on the town, um, she would have had her hair done in those very poofy side rolls like we see in her photograph. Then we have this absolutely amazing pair of stockings um, with this incredible embroidery and they are stamped with their maker. This is a uh, Balbriggan and this was an Irish manufacturer of hose and so um, we uh, looked it up in contemporary newspaper accounts and indeed Balbriggan was advertising their stockings in New York in the 1850s right when Carolyn would have been in the market for fancy stockings. They're stamped number nine on the toe, nine inches, Balbriggan on the toe. And what's uh, notable about these is the absolute lack of mending on them. There's uh, nowhere to the heel, there's no darning to the toe. Um, these were clearly special occasion stockings that were uh, worn very minimally. They weren't worn enough to, um, to, to be worn out, to develop holes. Um, and so it's probably a safe um, inference to make that these might have been Carolyn's wedding stockings that she wore and then carefully packed away. She might have brought them out for special occasions like parties, but she clearly didn't wear them out. And then the opposite end of the, you know, beautiful and elaborate spectrum, we have this um, rather plain uh, linen apron. Um, absolutely utilitarian, you know, there is no embroidery, there's nothing, um, no lace, there's nothing that prettiest this up. This is just a standard functional garment that one would tie over their skirt to uh, protect your um, dress that you're wearing. And clearly from the stains on it, this got a lot of use and uh, protected her garment from a lot of stains here. And what's wonderful about this um, is that it's clearly been starched. And even now, um, almost 170 years later, um, you can still feel like the crispiness of it and um, you know how it was, it was starched to look fresh. And then what came next was a nightgown. Actually, this might be considered more of a wrapper since it uh, opens all the way down. Um, but again, it bears Carolyn's laundry mark. So this is a garment that um, was strictly for wearing around the house. This is um, not something that she would have ever set foot out um, outside of her house in, and she wouldn't have received company in this either. And what's interesting about this is, I'm going to set this down so we can see the construction of it. Um, there's a distinct fullness to the bottom of it. Um, you see it's kind of pleated up here and then kind of... Um, the pleating expands on the bottom. So this clearly suggests a maternity garment. And so probably this is something that Caroline wore in the later stages of her pregnancy when she's probably spending a lot of time around the house and not going out a lot. So as we're going through um, this, this box, we're kind of transitioning from the, the petticoat that she might have worn that came to us with her wedding dress and her wedding stockings. And now we're seeing this young bride um, who is pregnant and her expanding pregnancy and the clothing that reflects uh, you know, her, her changing roles in, in life. And so this is um, 
these are Carolyn's drawers, uh, first to say. Um, this is a, obviously a women's undergarment. Um, they were split for ease of using the restroom. Um, and what's, I've never seen anything like this um, in all the years of my career, is that it has Carolyn's laundry mark on it. Um, and you'll notice that her first initial, CA, have been crossed out and the initials MH written in them. So you will recall that Carolyn died in childbirth. Um, her sister-in-law's name was Mary Hogue Sutherland. So what seems to have happened was that after Carolyn's death, um, her sister-in-law um, appropriated these drawers and crossed out her name and wrote her own initials in them. So um, I've, I've never seen that happen before. So these um, at least continued to have a useful life after Carolyn's death. Um, but what's also interesting is that uh, they've got this little string here that fastens the back. And this uh, puzzled me for a while. But the donor, um, who actually um, is a home economics teacher, pointed out that this was likely a 19th century life hack that expanded the waistband. Um, recall that Carolyn was pregnant, um, and so she probably extended her the waistband of her what would have been fairly tight-fitting drawers around her waist to accommodate um, her growing baby bump. And we actually see that on her petticoat as well. So that bit of information was able to put this in context as well. Again, she's got this um, petticoat that was made to fit a very narrow waist of a um, young bride. And then as her uh, figure changed throughout pregnancy, she did this you know, simple little quick fix. There's no elastic those days, so she expanded the waist to accommodate her baby. And the very last item we received for donation um, is another nightgown. This one does not have Carolyn's laundry mark in any place that's discernible, um, but there is what seems to be, uh, suggests maybe an inked S here for Sutherland. Although that might be wishful thinking, so I can't say 100%. Um, what is unique about this garment is that there's these sort of mysterious discolorations here. Um, and it's, it's hard to say what it could be from this perspective. Uh, this is something that um, we are interested in having analyzed. So um, we are planning to reach out to local forensics labs and see if perhaps we could get some forensic analysis of these stains and determine um, you know, if they're of human origin or not. And so um, having those tests done would kind of give us a little extra insight into this garment. Um, we know that Carolyn did die in childbirth, so it's possible that she may have, um, you know, um, it, it could even be blood, or it might be something as innocent as um, mildew or dirt from an old garment um, that kind of, you know, had a, had a rough life. So um, there are still mysteries to be discovered in this garment, so stay tuned. Um, we hope to maybe figure those out with some professional assistance in the future. So this is our collection, and what's amazing about it is that it's this wonderful snapshot of a woman who um, otherwise most of the details of her life would be lost to history. Um, she was a young wife and a young mother who tragically died in childbirth, and even more tragically, um, her fate was not uncommon in the 19th century. The mortality rate was very high for young women, and so there are countless women just like Carolyn um, who passed away in childbirth and are sort of lost to history. Um, but Carolyn's clothing and her story remain and from her we can see this arc of a young woman's wife from um, bride to uh, wife to um, expectant mother through her trousseau. And um, in, in a typical life cycle of a trousseau like this, the garments would be reused. They would use, be used until they probably either fell apart or were cut 
cut down to make rags or bandages or repurposed. Um, in Carolyn's case, they were packed away after her death and sat undisturbed. So uh, what we really have is a time capsule of this woman's life, which makes it such an important acquisition um, for us and such a poignant reminder of this woman's life. So with that, I will um, go back to uh, our other portion of the programming. I'll, I'll wrap up and show you um, some of the garments that are displayed in Fashioning Illinois, and then I will be happy to take questions. So thank you very much. Okay, so uh, thank you so much for, I, I had myself on mute because I can't stand it hear my own voice played back to me, um, but I was watching the chat. I appreciate how much interest there was and how um, dedicated all of you are to the clothing. I noticed some concerns about my um, not wearing gloves, so I love that you care enough about the artifacts to uh, point that out and ask about that. The um, kind of standard practice in the museum field is that for um, clothing, it's okay to just wash your hands, um, especially if you're working with older textiles, because if you put on gloves, especially cotton gloves, you can lose a lot of dexterity. And that's often um, more important than the physical barrier um, is being able to, you know, handle fine garments in a way where you really have full use of your tactile sensation and your fingertips. Um, the same is actually true over in the main building kind of curator and when you're dealing with um, old papers and documents the same thing you want to have clean hands but if you wear gloves trying to turn an old page you might end up you know like tearing the page or flaking it off or something um, the thing that um, maybe you also caught that uh, was a mistake on my part was I should have removed my wedding rings um, it's generally best not to wear jewelry on your hands when handling garments because of the possibility that um, the uh, stone on my ring could have caught on it it didn't happen, but um, I won't make that mistake for the next show, let's say that. Um, so thank you for being vigilant. And um, I do want to also say that, you know, I kind of pulled those things out of the box and set them down for the video. Uh, once the camera was turned off, I went through and, you know, laid them out carefully and made sure they weren't wrinkled or bunched up or anything. Um, and as a final note, they're actually remarkably sturdy. They're all uh, linen garments and linen is a pretty like hardy fabric. It held up to a lot of washings and stuff. Um, well, after the camera was turned off, Elizabeth made the comment about the drawers with the name in them um, and just how much work hand sewing and making one's own garments had to represent. You know, today, um, maybe appropriating such an intimate piece of clothing is kind of like, Ugh, you know, but for a woman of that time, um, I'm sure that Carolyn's sister-in-law, Mary, thought like, well, there's like 16 hours of my life sewing myself a pair of drawers, or I can just make use of this pair that's not being used here, you know? So the, the amount of labor that making one's own clothes and caring for one's own clothes and maintaining one's own clothes went um, in a typical course of a woman's life. So again, thank you for bearing with that video. Um, keep moving along here. I want to run you through uh, what's on exhibit now. Um, in Fashioning Illinois, we actually have four pieces of um, Carolyn's clothing on exhibit uh, because not only are they um, astounding as a time capsule of a young woman's life in the 1850s, um, but they're also really strong individual representations of the garments that they represent. Um, so her chemise is just a really nice example of a mid 18. 50 chemise. So this is in our underpinning section, um, which we will be covering in a December talk. If you want to keep an eye out for that and join us for that. Um, this is the one um, or one of the ones that has her name uh, stamped under the arm. And then we have the pair of drawers, um, which again is just a really nice example and that uh, detail in the waistband is so unusual. Um, we weren't able to show it because of the way the garment is displayed, but we did create an image of it so people could see um, what went on um, and emphasize that laundry mark, which is such a unique feature. And then we have a um, another maternity 
um, dressing gown. And I say dressing gown because this one buttons all the way to the ground. Um, and this one uh, underneath, there's kind of a drawstring that ties over the belly, which is a great uh, 19th century feature. And um, maternity clothes really don't survive that much. Um, in modern day, um, I mean maternity clothes that date to the 19th century, because maternity wasn't a specific category of clothing in general. Um, people generally took the clothing that they had and altered it to accommodate a pregnancy, um, or they created a garment specifically for pregnancy, but then they would alter it afterwards. They might wear it out, they might use it for another pregnancy, um, they might turn it into a nightgown for a child, um, um, eventually it would be cut up for rags. And so um, this nightgown probably survives um, because sadly Caroline did pass away in childbirth. And so she simply didn't survive to um, wear out or repurpose this um, maternity nightgown. And finally, we have um, Carolyn's wedding dress, the place where it all started. Um, so again, as I mentioned in the video, we do have this complete arc of a young bride in New York, um, her move to Illinois, her impending motherhood, the change of her figure as her body is changing, um, and then, you know, sadly, her death. And it all happened in a year. Um, and, you know, it's, it's the cycle that happened to so many young women in an era when um, maternal mortality was so high. Um, but fortunately, Carolyn's items survive and through her, her story survives. And by extension, the stories of all the women who shared a similar fate survive. And we know a little bit more about them and um, in, in the life cycle of their lives. So um, again, thank you so much for listening. I'm happy to field any questions now. And I do also want to put my email address up on the screen. If anyone has any questions or would like more information, um, please do feel free to drop me a line. Um, so Elizabeth, are you able to see the questions? Do you want to kind of shoot them at me so I can answer them out loud? Yeah, I can do that. What time period were laundry marks common? Um, you see them really from the 18th century on, and um, oftentimes they're embroidery. Um, I've seen names or initials on um, things, and then um, pen starts to become more common in the um, 19th century, and then that stamp is... Um, I think the stamp was kind of a special thing. Carolyn um, had a little, you know, C.A. Sutherland. Um, it was a distinctive stamp, so that's in the 1800s and continues on probably into the early 20th century, unless you're sent to summer camp, in which case you still write your name with Sharpie in your underpants. Um, Deborah wanted to know, do you ever wash clothing after it is acquired? Will starch and soap residue degrade the material? Um, we do not wash it. Uh, there is a conservator uh, that we work with. And so if something is especially grimy, we will send it to him and he will do it professionally. But I would never um, dare to do anything to a, a garment that, that came to us. Um, can you share, this is an easy one. How, how long is the exhibit up and this where is it? It is at our main facility at the Illinois State Museum in downtown Springfield. Um, our address is 502 South Spring Street, and it will be up through May of next year. So there is still plenty of time to come and see it. Um, here's a question I know we get a lot um, from Luann. What types of clothing is the State Museum typically interested in? She uh, donated a wedding dress from 1870 to the Illinois County Historical Society. Does the museum um, ever hold a Q&A on, on old clothing? So I think asking, um, you know, what do, are we taking donations? Um, and do you ever just do a program on, on the clothing in our exhibits? Um, 
let me start. The first one is, yes, we're accepting donations. Um, we actually have a fairly strong textile collection, and this is why it was so fun to do Fashioning Illinois, because um, we have all these garments that hadn't ever been on display before. Um, so we have garments that were donated to us individually. We have garments that were transferred to us from Illinois State University, like Carolyn's wedding dress was, and also a large collection of garments that were transferred to us from the University of Illinois. Um, so at this point, in terms of garments, we're looking for things that have a story and a solid history. So um, the more information that we know about the wearer, the better, you know, name, date, where they were born. If there's a photograph of them, great. If there is a photograph of them in the garment, even better. Um, and so, um, yeah, just really trying to um, connect people to a personal narrative with the garment. And also um, condition is an issue too, because sadly there's lots of beautiful, beautiful clothes that just haven't um, held up today. So um, if there's something that we are able to care for and hopefully one day um, exhibit factors into it as well. And in terms of a Q and A, um, no, but you know that would be fun to do. I would probably have to recruit some extra help too because uh, I there's lots of times that I'm stumped. But um, we have talked about going through our collection center and just pulling a box of garments off the shelf and going through it and seeing what's in it. So um, that would be fun to do someday. Um, so there was some discussion about um, the color of 19th century wedding dresses, and I think it got pretty much resolved in the chat, but Deborah was wondering, was um, Caroline's wedding dress uh, white or off-white when it was first made? It looks like it was off-white, and um, I didn't um, see that part of the chat, but uh, yes, people are exactly right that you could have both. Um, Queen Victoria did popularize white wedding dresses in 1840, but it by no means became the rule. It wasn't until probably around World War I-ish that like most wedding dresses tended to be white. Um, up until the early 20th century, it was still quite common for women to get married in their best dress. And you know, it's a pretty dress that you wear to your wedding, but then you wear it to a fancy party and then you know in two years when it's kind of out of date you might change the ribbons or bows on it and update it a little bit so it can still be your nice dress so um having the means to have a dress that was specifically dedicated to one day in your life uh, was really a luxury when um, fabric was relatively expensive and also the labor that went into it um, was so intensive. So Carolyn, the fact that she did have this off-white dress that's very, you know, distinctly a wedding dress um, is a sign of her affluence. So a couple questions about Caroline's husband. Um, one was um, what um, what job did he have? I think someone asked what job did he have and did she, was she able to maintain her, the lifestyle that she had grown up in, in Illinois? And then what happened to him? So these are great questions. And honestly, we don't know the answer. Um, they, because they got married in 1854, um, they fall between the census, right? So, um, you know, he, and because John Layton or Reuben Layton, whatever his name is, is, is fairly common, you know, it, it's not like his name was Aloysius or something that would jump out at you. Um, he sort of disappears from the historical record. There's a sense that he might have gone to Chicago or another city and I think probably remarried, but we really don't know. Um, and that's kind of a neat uh, flip of the script because usually um, it's the man who leaves his mark on the historical record and his wife is usually no more than a name and we don't always know much about the wives. But in this case, um, it's very clearly, you know, Caroline's narrative and her family history that's been preserved. And the husband is just sort of a guy who comes and then disappears. All right, so kind of lost to history. Um... Let's see. Uh, someone asked, is there a possibility that the exhibit will be extended due to the pandemic? 
Um, it actually already was. So this exhibit was meant to open on March 21st. So if you can all remember where we were on March 21st, it was kind of all reeling with shock at a world that had suddenly turned upside down. Um, so obviously the exhibit didn't open then. It kind of um, oozed open in July when the museum reopened to the public. Um, and it was supposed to close on January 10th of next year. And so it was extended through the end of May. Um, you know, we are open to the possibility of traveling it. So um, if we get an inquiry or uh, the stars align for it to, you know, show at our Lockport Gallery, perhaps um, it could go on the road. But as of now, um, there's still, what is that? Like there's still a good seven months. So um, there, there's time to see it. All right, um, we are um, at 7.05, so just in the interest of time here, um, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. Um, yes, as Erica mentioned, um, if you enjoyed this program, you can feel free to make a donation to the Illinois State Museum Society. Um, that is the nonprofit that supports the Illinois State Museum in its work um, in doing exhibits like this and uh, providing a uh, providing programming like this one. I just dropped the link into the uh, chat once more. You will also be getting an email in a couple of days as a follow-up that will have that, um, that link in it. It will also have a link um, to a survey if you would be willing to uh, take, that out, take that and let us know what you think. I am also going to drop the name and link to the registration for our next uh, program in the chat. It will be uh, called Mend and Make Do, Caring for Clothing in the 19th Century. Um, and that's Tuesday, November 17th at 7 p.m. And there's a registration through Zoom that I just dropped in the chat for that too. So um, we're excited. Um, you are all going to feel much better about your laundry tasks um, mm -hmm. after this program, believe me. Um, the display of what it took to do laundry at this time in the museum, in the exhibit, of it is just fantastic. Thank you all for coming and joining us. We really appreciate it. We had well over 200 people tonight, which is fantastic. We love that you all continue to be interested in this program. Thank you to Erica for the fantastic programming and all of this, and we hope you all have a great night.